Hello. Um, so actually, strangely enough, two days ago, my talk went up on TED.com. And that, that's the same talk that I was going to give here today. So I thought I'd start with that and then get into something else. And also, it, it's quite about the future of the book. So here goes. Can I have, oops, sorry, one second. Let's put the sound in. story begins right here actually in Rajasthan about two years ago. I was in the desert under the starry skies with this Sufi singer Muktiar Ali and we were in conversation about how nothing had changed since the time of the ancient Indian epic the Mahabharat. So back in the day when us Indians wanted to travel we'd jump into our chariots and we'd zoom across the sky. Now we do the same with aeroplanes. Back then when Arjuna, the great Indian warrior prince, when he was thirsty, he'd take out a bow, he'd shoot it into the ground and water would come out. Now we do the same with drills and machines. The conclusion that we came to was that magic had been replaced by machinery. And this made me really sad. <laughs> I, I found myself becoming a little bit of a technophobe. I was terrified by this idea that I would lose the ability to enjoy and appreciate a sunset without having my camera on me, without tweeting it to my friends. And it felt like, it felt like technology should enable magic, not kill it. When, when I was a little girl, my grandfather gave me his little silver pocket watch. And this piece of 50-year-old technology became the most magical thing to me. It became a gilded gateway into a world full of pirates and shipwrecks and images in my imagination. So I felt like our cell phones and our fancy watches and our cameras had stopped us from dreaming. They've stopped us from being inspired. And so I jumped in. I jumped into this world of technology to see how I could use it to enable magic as opposed to kill it. I've been illustrating books since I was 16, and so when I saw the iPad, I saw it as a storytelling device that could connect readers all over the world. It could, it could, um, it could know how we're holding it. It can, it can know where we are. It, it brings together image and text and animation and sound and touch. Storytelling is becoming more and more multisensorial. But what are we doing with it? So I'm actually just going to go in and launch Koya. Um, an interactive app for the iPad. So it says, place your fingers upon each light. And so... type in my name and actually become a character in the book. At various points, uh, a little letter drops down to me and the iPad knows where you live because of GPS. It's actually addressed to me. The child in me is really excited by these kind of possibilities. Now, I've been, I've been talking a lot about magic and I don't mean wizards and dragons. I mean the kind of childhood magic, those ideas that we all harbored as children. This idea of fireflies in a jar, for some reason, was always really exciting to me. And so, over here, you need to tilt your iPad, take the fireflies out, and they actually illuminate your way through the rest of the book. Another idea that really fascinated me as a child was, was that an entire galaxy could be contained within a single marble. And so, over here, each book and each world becomes into a little marble that I drag in to this magical device within the device and it opens up a map. 
All along, all fantasy books have always had maps, but these maps have been static. This is a map that grows and glows and becomes your navigation for the rest of the book. It reveals itself to you at certain points in the book as well. So I'm just going to enter in. Another thing that's actually really important to me is creating content that is Indian and yet very contemporary. Over here, these are the Apsaras. So we've all heard about fairies and we've all heard about nymphs, but how many people outside of India know about their Indian counterparts, the Apsaras? These poor Apsaras have been trapped inside Indra's chambers for thousands of years in an old and musty book. And so we're bringing them back in a contemporary story for children. actually deals with new issues like the environmental crisis. Speaking of the environmental crisis, um, I think a big problem has been in the last 10 years is that children have been locked inside their rooms, glued to their PCs, they haven't been able to get out. But now with mobile technology, we can actually take our children outside into the natural world with their technology. One of the interactions in the book is that you're sent off on this quest where you need to go outside, take out your camera on the iPad and collect pictures of different natural objects. When I was a child, I had multiple collections of sticks and stones and pebbles and shells, and somehow kids don't do that anymore. So in bringing back this childhood ritual, you need to go out and in one chapter, take a picture of a flower and then tag it. Um, in another chapter, you need to take a picture of a piece of bark and then tag that. And what happens is that you actually create a digital collection of photographs that you can then put up online. A child in London puts up a picture of a fox and says, oh, I saw a fox today, a child in India says, I saw a monkey today, and it creates this kind of social network around a collection of digital photographs that you've actually taken. In terms of, uh, in, in, in the possibilities of linking together magic, the earth, and technology, there are multiple possibilities. In the next book, we, we plan on having an interaction where you take your iPad out with the video on, and through augmented reality, you see this layer of animated pixies appear on a house plant that's outside your house. Um, at one point, your screen is filled up with leaves, and so you need to make the sound of wind and blow them away and read the rest of the book. We, we're moving. We're all moving here to a world where the forces of nature come closer together to technology, and magic and technology can come, come closer together. We're harnessing energy from the sun. We're, we're bringing our children and ourselves closer to the natural world and that magic and joy and childhood love that we had through the simple medium of a story. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that came out about three days ago and it's had about uh, 1,70,000 views since, so I'm kind of going like woohoo at the moment. <laughs> um, so it's actually really nice being here as well, because uh, I don't know how many of you know, but I actually studied in that building in Shrishti. And a lot of what you just saw was my diploma project for Shrishti, and then I launched it out into, into the world uh, and into the App Store um, as my diploma project. So, and, and even the Kabir project that I mentioned earlier, I went traveling with the, the Sufi musician Mukti Arali, so he, the Kabir project is housed in this building. Um, so you've seen that, and I thought I'd give you a little bit of a backstory uh, since we're here talking about children and education and how, how children choose their careers and what they make with their lives, and I'm quite a child myself at 23. Um, so I think my journey begins with my mother. My mother, Nilofa Suleiman, she was a cartographer at one point before she became a fine artist. And as a child, I'd spend hours watching her pore over those maps and creating rivers and mountains with her fingers. And each delicately inkspelt word would become a beautiful gateway into a world where I was an explorer and I'd go out and do all kinds of things. I started painting when I was about 12 years old. And I was allowed to paint, which is what was great as well. Um, and back then, I just drop ink bottle after ink bottle and uh, watch, watch it snake and morph before my eyes without my mind directing it. 
And this is the kind of stuff I would do with like 13 and stuff. And then it's quite creepy if you ask me for a little girl who looks like that with those pixie wings and, and, and all of that. Um, and when people ask me, and yeah, this, this little girl with pixie wings. Um, and when people ask me, uh, you know, where do your drawings come from? I would always say, it came to me. But then who came to me? What came to me? Um, what, what is this giant source of imagination that, that just comes to us? Uh, you know, Salman Rushdie called it the ocean of notion, the sea of stories. Some people call it the, the unconscious, the pre-conscious, the subconscious, the collective consciousness. But I don't think I can put the, this giant source of ideas into the tiny box of a word. As, as they said, I started illustrating books when I was 16. And I did it because um, when, I was a, when I was a child, uh, me and my friends, we'd spend hours just creating words that, that somehow we could both see. You know, we'd have these like castles and stuff, and we could both see these invisible castles. And I think that's quite something. And I didn't want to stop sharing those worlds, so I started illustrating books and creating them. What I, what I think is so fascinating about illustration in general is that each page that I draw becomes this paper boat that goes off into a world where, you know, lovers are united, or uh, you're, you're whisked away in, in a yellow ambassador of, of a man with a curly mustache. Um, but when I, when I often tell people that I'm an illustrator, they, they say, ah, cartoonist, ah. <laughs> and that makes me go a little bit like, well, excuse me. <laughs> um, I, think, I think in one sense, a lot, of, a lot of the history of the world has actually been recorded through illustration. You look at the, the paintings in, in caves or even the beautiful Ravi Varmas that, that many people spend a lot of money on and frame very carefully and keep in their house, keep in their museum. They're all illustrations. They're illustrating stories about, you know, things that people hunted or, um, or different epics from, from, from India. And so actually, I, I thought I'd show you a little bit of what goes into making an illustrated book. So you remember that, that first screen, place your hands upon each light in Koya, my iPad app. Um, so of course, it just looks like a pretty drawing of a hand. But it's also actually a, an old symbol called the hand of Hamsa, or the hand of Fatima, which uh, used to protect doorways in houses in the Middle East and and Iran, and, and even in, in parts of sort of that part of India. Um, and so over here, it, it symbolically protects the doorway of the app. And I think that's quite interesting as well, that new and contemporary stories can draw from old traditions and old symbols. Um, also, what goes into making it, so it's not just like I you know, whip up my pen and come up with a cool cartoon, um, but it also takes a lot of research into, and quite academic research, if I might say so myself. <laughs> Um, into into archetypes and mythology and and finding references and and um, you know like for example with this character Salpa who who's in the next book of Koya she's inspired by all the the, the sort of age old archaic connections between snakes and um, goddesses in mythology we have Eve uh, and the snake in the garden and we also have Manasa in India who's a snake goddess uh, who's Shiva's kind of lost daughter who is taken away from the Garden of Eden, so to speak. And then there are loads and loads of character sketches. Um, and sometimes I even make a 3D model of my character before she finally becomes what she is. And then one also needs to create an environment for, for that character. So it's actually like building an entire universe in your mind. Uh, so these are the kind of inspirations. And then I created this illustration for this space. Uh, which had, this is Sarpa's lair, so to speak, and it had like this old gnarled tree and one of those uh, snake stones next to it, and it opened up a chamber where the, where the kids in the book entered in. Um, now we've all heard about Dumbledore, and we've all heard about Gandalf, but uh, the same archetype of this wise, age-old hermit exists in India too. He exists in, in Vyasa, he exists in all our Babas and Rishikesh sitting by the Ganga, he exists in uh, New Age gurus like Sadhguru and Osho. Um, so it's quite interesting to see for me that I can actually now use these, these Indian archetypes and bring them out into a global platform with the iPad. So yes, art can be very serious and art can be very personal and illustration can also bring together a lot of collectivism. But sometimes it can just be fun. So, so I'm also going to show you a little bit of that. I uh, started a group called the Bangalore Wallflowers along with two of my friends, Riddhi and Siddharth, about four years ago. And the idea there was to actually make art less serious and less sort of heavy and, uh, and 
less restricted just to artists. So what we did was we basically got together a whole bunch of kids and people, and particularly non-artists, uh, in, in different communities and got them to paint a wall together. It seems like quite a simple thing, but actually you get over a lot in that process. I find that I was allowed to always draw on my walls with crayons and things, but not everybody is. And so people actually get afraid of walls. They're afraid of leaving a permanent mark on a wall because they don't know how to paint, or they'll say, oh, I'm terrible at drawing, I'm rubbish at drawing. Um, but when people actually just come together and start to paint it, miracles happen. One thing is that Bangaloreans complain a, a lot about how the BBMP walls are ugly, or how the government doesn't do anything about our roads. But very, very few Bangaloreans actually come up and say, well, I can paint a wall, can't I? I can paint it red. It could make some kind of difference. And what's been really nice about it as well is that people have, from all, all communities have come up and said, we want to paint a wall with you. Um, what's also been very nice is that while we've been painting, like Church Street, for example, the little girls with roses who sell roses on Church Street or these boys who shine shoes on Church Street actually come up and start painting with, with uh, you know, kids possibly from schools like Aditi. We've, we've also worked with Parikrama, actually, and those kids were fantastic because they, they, they were like the, the best artists and dancers that I'd met in a very long time. Um, this is a bus that I just painted, actually, in the last week, which was also one of those long dreams that I want to do. do. But if, but, so art does also belong to community, but art also belongs to the self. And I think that's possibly the most, uh, the, the, the root, the most important thing of all, is to listen to those doodles. Um, I, I've spent my entire life basically keeping heavily illustrated journals of everywhere that I've traveled to and all the things that I've done and all the random thoughts that are passing in my head. And they're basically doodles. They're the same doodles that I used to do in class when I was in the Valley School and have now extended into these, these big journals. And I think it's really, really important for, for all the kids out here and all the parents to let their children listen to those doodles and listen to do the, the humming in the bathroom and see whether that can actually become something. Um, and, and also, I, I quote Rumi as I conclude, just to let the beauty of what they love be what they do. Thank you. <laughs>